everybody, and welcome to our first in the series of companion guides to the Wheel of Time. These videos are designed to be watched along with each chapter of each book of the Wheel of Time series. Now this video is going to be split into two parts. The first section will be a simple recap of the chapter and will be spoiler free for anything that comes later in the book or in the series. This section is designed for those of you that are reading through the books for the first time and it will include a recap of the story as well as some visuals like maps and pictures they are going to help you understand what you just read. It's perfect to watch right after just finishing a chapter. Now the second section will contain major spoilers for the rest of the series. There we will be getting into the foreshadowing for the rest of the story, the unanswered questions from the chapter, general easter eggs, and some analysis of the themes and concepts from the chapter, as well as some general thoughts that go beyond non-spoiler discussion. This section is designed for those of you who are rereading the series and want companion information to accompany their reread. You'll see a spoiler warning pop up so you will have ample time to change the video once we get to that point if you haven't read all of the books yet. Make sure if you are a new reader not to read any of the comments on this video as there will likely be spoiler filled comments in the comment section. You can also find timestamps in the video description that will take you to the spoiler section or to the non-spoiler section. Now all of these videos are sponsored by audible.com and you can find a link in the description of the video where you can get a free audiobook great for listening to the Wheel of Time books as well as reading them. So let's hop right into our spoiler free recap of the prologue for the Eye of the World titled Dragon Mount. The story opens with Luz Theron Telamon wandering through the remnants of his palace. There are dead men, women, and children all along the floors of the palace. The narration indicates that these people were killed by some sort of power that had chased them even as they tried to escape. Luz Theron Telamon is seemingly unaware of the destruction and death around him. He continues to search the palace, calling for his wife Ilyena. A man appears behind him with the air shimmering and rippling until the man simply appears from nothing. The man is dressed in black and Luz Theron does not seem to know who he is instead asking him if he has come to take part in the singing or just to visit. The man identifies himself as Elon Morin Tedrani, and Luz Theron remembers his other name, Betrayer of Hope. Luz Theron continues to ignore the man's taunts, instead asking about where his wife Ilyena could be. Elon Morin, the man dressed in black, mocks Luz Theron, saying that he had once stood first among the servants. Once you wore the Ring of Tamerlan and sat in the high seat. Once you summoned the Nine Rods of Dominion. Now look at you, a pitiful shattered wretch. He then uses a version of healing to give Luz Theron clarity and remove the madness from his mind. The healing is extremely painful, but once the pain dissipates, Luz Theron is now aware of the dead lying all around his palace and sees his wife Ilyena Sunhair lying dead. He screams in agony and then turns to confront the betrayer, who he blames for her death. He states that for ten years the betrayer's master had racked the world, but then he's interrupted as the betrayer tells him that their battles have been occurring since the beginning of time, and that they will continue to fight until the shadow is triumphant. But the betrayer of hope reminds him that it was Luz Theron who had killed his family and everyone he loved. Stricken with overwhelming grief, pain, and guilt, Luz Theron uses the true source, although Sidene is tainted, to travel. Essentially, Luz Theron uses the true source, or the magic, of this world to transport himself to a remote area devoid of habitation. He finds himself on a flat land with a large river nearby. Giving in to his grief and guilt over what he had done, he draws so much of the One Power that he destroys himself by channeling a great amount of the One Power into the earth and a large volcanic mountain forms in that flat plain. The mountain is miles high, and its forming reshapes the area, pushing a curve into the previously straight river and forming a long island in the middle of that river. After the creation of the mountain and the island, the black-clad man again appears on the island, and his face shows rage and contempt at the events that had just occurred. He vows that it isn't over between them and that their battle will not be done until the end of time and then vanishes. And that concludes the prologue. So now we're going to move on to to our spoiler filled section. Please click off the video at this point if you haven't finished the series, as we'll be doing a complete deep dive into the chapter that will cover the rest of the books with foreshadowing and other things. I'm going to give you a couple more seconds. You've been warned. So let's kick off the breakdown of the chapter by discussing all of the foreshadowing. First of all, when Ishamael appears behind Luz Theron, it states that the air shimmers and ripples and that he just kind of appears. Now from what we later find out about traveling, this isn't what it looks like. 
at all, or how it appears to other people when people do it. This implies that Ishamael is using the true power, or the power from the Dark One here, and not the One Power. I know sometimes people get confused with those. This is consistent about what we later learn about traveling with the true power, as it's basically ripping open a hole and stepping through it. Ishamael states that he follows a different power now. And speaking of Ishamael, this one may be obvious, but the prologue never actually refers to him as Ishamael, but rather by his given name of Alan Morin Tedrani, or by the Betrayer of Hope. This is actually because they are speaking the Old Tongue, and Ishamael means Betrayer of Hope in the Old Tongue. That is more than likely the word that Luz Theron used when he was saying Betrayer of Hope, was he was also saying Ishamael. But since we're seeing this from his point of view, we just get the meaning of the word and not the actual word itself. Additionally, Ishamael tells Luz Theron that they have fought thousands upon thousands of battles with the turning of the wheel, and that they will continue to fight until the shadow is triumphant. Now this is very indicative of Ishamael's philosophy and reason for turning to the shadow in the first place. He believed that if the wheel of time would continue to turn forever, that at some point the shadow would eventually be triumphant and break the wheel and that that would be inevitable. This is why he joined the shadow, and you can see the seeds of that philosophy here when he's talking to Luce Theron in the prologue of the series. Now, on an aside here, I've always found that philosophy flawed, and I found it odd that Ishamael could be a great philosopher, as he professed, and everybody thought he was. And I'll break down the reason why I think that's a little weird. It really doesn't make sense. It comes down to the nature of infinity. I've mentioned this in another video before. Ishamael's argument is essentially this. Given infinite turnings of the wheel of time, the shadow will eventually win because in infinity, every possible occurrence will happen. And if the shadow wins, that will break the wheel of time. So it doesn't make sense not to follow the shadow because they will eventually win. Now this is flawed for a number of reasons, but the primary reason is that if they are already on an infinite wheel of time, then infinite amounts of time have passed before them as well as will come after them. And if that's the case, then if the dark one was to win and break the wheel, it would have already happened. So the fact that it has not happened means that the Dark One will never truly win. Anyways, I always found this philosophy flawed. Whatever. Another piece of foreshadowing here is the creation of Dragon Mount and the island that would become Tarvalin. On my first read-through, I didn't actually notice this, but that's mainly because we didn't even really have a description of what Tarvalin was until the Great Hunt, other than a dream for Rand. So we wouldn't have had the perspective to understand what the significance of this island was. Now, I love this type of foreshadowing from Robert Jordan, and I believe it's what makes the book so rereadable. He puts things in the books that we really won't understand until much later, or even on another read-through, and I think that's what gives such depth to the books and what makes these so rereadable. The last bit of foreshadowing comes with the quotes at the end of the prologue. They come from the Fourth Age, and although they describe the events of the breaking of the world and the rebirth of the dragon, they are written at a time after the last battle, implying from the very beginning that the light will be victorious again. Now, there are a couple themes at play in the prologue that are echoed throughout the books, and I think they're worth pointing out here. Pride is a central theme to Luz Theron Telemann's character and also to the people of the Age of Legends. He seemingly admits to his pride being the cause of his downfall before he ends his life. He's extremely powerful, but it seems that he was used to getting his way and always being the smartest person in the room. That pride led him to attempt to seal the boar without the help of the women. Additionally, we see this come up with Ishamael and the other Forsaken repeatedly. A good number of the Forsaken join the ranks of the Shadow because of disrespect or slights or perceived slights from Luz Theron Telamon. Whether they were real or not, it seems that he was the source of envy and jealousy for lots and lots of people, and he did not seem to quell that jealousy very well. We can see these slights on display as a Shamael, who is described as a calculating philosopher for most of the story, desperately wants Luce Theron to know how far he has fallen. He taunts him by telling of his former position as the leader of the servants, or the Aes Sedai. He heals him simply so that he could know it was a Shamael that had beaten him, and to make sure that he knew he was responsible for the deaths of his family. It's an odd contrast that someone who is normally so calculating and emotionless could be driven by the simple need to rub it into Luce Theron's face. Lastly, there are a number of unanswered questions that are sparked by the prologue that I think are worth taking a look at. First, Luz Theron makes the comment that Ishamael shouldn't use the name Shaitan, as it is dangerous to say out loud. Now, this is echoed later in the story when Rand thinks that he has done something wrong in the Great Hunt by naming the Dark One. Now, this is never truly fleshed out to why that's dangerous or what the result of naming the Dark One truly was outside of just being superstitious. And again, it's easy to say Rand was just being superstitious because he's a country farm boy, 
But Luce Theron would have known about it for sure, and he seemed to think it was actually dangerous. So what is so dangerous about it? Shamael later mentions that it's too bad that Luce Theron's sisters aren't there to heal him. Now, it's interesting that there seems to be that the assumption that only the female channelers heal for some reason. Why did Ashamael specifically say sisters over other servants or healers? The best answer I can think of here is that all the male channelers were going insane and that it would take a sister to heal him. Additionally, Ashamael performed some type of healing on Luz Theron to restore his sanity. What type of healing was that? It is implied by Ashamael that Aes Sedai would not be able to give him more than just a few minutes of sanity. And then he states that Shaitan's healing is different. So what is the nature of that healing? Did he extend the same protection against the taint that the other Forsaken had? Is that how he kind of wiped away the madness? Who knows? Another question for the ages is what the heck a dragon is. Ashamayel says that the people named Luz Theron the dragon, something that we know is true. What we don't know is exactly what a dragon is or why he earned that title. We know what dragons are in our mythology and in the way that we think of them at least, but they don't exist in this world. But the banner describes a dragon. So where does the term come from? Is it just the same term that we've always had? Um, has that lasted over, you know, the different ages of the wheel? And the last unanswered question that is posed here is this. Why is Ashamayel already free? It's later explained that he was never totally sealed in the boar, and we see him reappear every thousand years or so in the story for a period of 40 years. Aaron, son of Malan, son of Sanar, and Ogir, reported that people saw Ashamayel up to 40 years after the sealing of the boar and speculated that he was released in 40 year increments. The other question that this brings up is how long had the boar been sealed when Ashamayel arrived at Luz Theron's home? It can't have been that long as Ashamayel says the hundred companions were currently ravaging the world and that more would follow implying that the taint hadn't quite taken over every male channeler yet. Do you have any thoughts of any unanswered questions or foreshadowing from the prologue? Make sure to let me know in the comments of the video. Additionally, make sure to join us at thegreatblight.com for more in this series and like this video and subscribe to the channel as well. You can find the link to the video series sponsor, audible.com, in the description of this video. Thanks again for watching and look for the next video in the series. Should come up right after this, depending on when you're watching it. Uh, otherwise, thanks for watching. Peace out. Think you're in the kitchen with a job of work to do My mistress up above, slipping on a robe of blue She prances down the staircase, a fancy us a free Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?